it's that moment again, Alan, where we sit there and we go, oh, here we go, welcome everybody. We like to see those numbers participants click up. And the incredible Alan is really under the pump at the moment. He's doing back-to-back -back webinars. How many today, Alan? I've been up to, oh, this is my fourth, um, but I've been graciously hosted by the morning show on Channel 7, um, which has been wonderful just to go out nationwide to have a conversation around being the change and showing kindness and compassion, um, demonstrating an acceptative point of view. I love that. And, and I I'm, will go easy on you, but I know this is your passion and I know what it's like. I'm on four today as well, but mine's much easier. I don't, I just rant and then leave where you're being asked about a whole lot of stuff that's very important. And right now it's incredibly important. So welcome everybody that's joined us from around Australia and in New Zealand as well. So I'm just going to kick off by just doing a little intro. <laughs> intro. I'm going to introduce the incredible Alan. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Fiona Crichton, and you know I am the VP Clinical at Brew. And we're joined by, um, we're here to acknowledge White Ribbon Day, and we are here joined by Alan Ball. Right, White, oh, I can't say it. Alan, I don't know how you can do it. White Ribbon Day um, 2022 is 18th of November in Australia and the 25th of November in New Zealand. It's the world's largest movement engaging men and boys to end men's violence against women and girls, promote gender equality and create new opportunities for men to build positive, healthy and respectful relationships. So we're going to talk to the incredible Alan Ball. He is our special guest. He's backed by popular demand. And so really, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's going on right now. This must be the busiest part of the year. What's it all about? What should we know? What is White Ribbon Day, really? Well, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge Gadigal country um, and pay my respects to elders past, future and emerging. Um, and as I say always, um, this is their land, always will be their land, and sovereignty was never ceded. And Fiona, it is just wonderful to be back in your company. Um, I have been doing my day, um, my my one task a day. I always get it wrong, so I'll just call it a dot um, that um, J, um, JK has taught me. And my my one thing that I'll be doing today is actually tuning into myself, getting out of my head and into my body. Because um, when you run back to back um, and you're operating across multiple time zones and catching lots of different planes, it takes a toll um, on your emotional and physical self. So my one thing today is when I'm on the plane to, to switch off, um, to not be on the laptop, not take advantage of the Wi-Fi or be on my phone and scrolling through social media, but to be there just in myself in the present moment. So um, that's what um, I'm going to do today. I'm thrilled and I think you definitely need it um, because you are going to be um, running, literally running after this webinar to catch your plane. So your life is incredibly busy right now and we need mm. you recharged and healthy and looking after yourself because your work is so valuable, it's important. And even when we're doing the most valuable things for others, it's incredibly important that we are taking that time for self because you're one person and you are not a machine. And often when we are really passionate about our projects, we can feel like we're machines. So I'm glad that you're dotting I should pass it on to JK. It's really important doing that one thing that you know will stand down the amygdala and just reset and recharge. Oh, All thank right. you. Great. So tell me a little bit about White Ribbon Day. For those who don't know, tell me about its genesis and where we are and what's mm -hmm. exciting this year. In Australia, we have just launched a national framework that really sets Australia up for a generation to stop violence against women and children. And what we need is we need the opportunity to have a pit stop because if we are really going to reflect and pause and think about being the change, we need moments to make that time available. And White Ribbon Australia um, provides or is the host or custodian of White Ribbon Day here in Australia. Um, our New Zealand counterparts, of course, celebrate that um, on the 25th. But ultimately, it's not just a day. It's a call to action for that day and it's a reminder that we've got a whole year and a whole lifespan and, in fact, now we've got Commonwealth Government advice, we've got a, an entire generation to get this right. There is no more pressing time right now to ensure that changes are occurring in every single community, including our workplaces. 
In Australia, the national plan sets an ambitious target and it also talks about the environment of the workplace as being really critical as a setting to, in, to promote respect. And not just respect as lip service or rhetoric, but respect now legislated. So whether or not that's paid domestic violence leave, looking at the role of fathers in parenting and making sure that parenting leave is accessible to all types of family situations. And it also looks at the casual, the everyday conversations that occur and to ensure that kindness and compassion are leading those conversations rather than being excluded from them. And we're asking Australia, and we've been joined by the world to be that change. And Fiona, change to you, to me, to Groove, to White Ribbon, means something completely different. I'm not expecting that everybody suddenly goes out and gets a degree in primary prevention or runs a national movement against men's violence towards women and children. There is so much work that needs to happen in those individual moments that are not monitored, that are there. The only person really judging them is yourself and the person you're interacting with. So we're asking really to do simple things um, that can be a bit challenging and complex, things like understanding and being aware of the signs of sexism and calling it out when you see it, modelling respectful relationships and interactions. It's not just about relationships, it's the interactions we have as well. And really challenging gender-based stereotypes. Um, I think we've all heard of the sayings, boys will be boys, um, boys don't cry, um, treat her mean to keep her keen or um, bread, male breadwinner. What these things actually do is create a certain ideal about what masculinity ought to be, and that's when we unravel. Mm -hmm. We know that masculinities is really diverse. Masculinity is really diverse. And if we uphold just one form of masculinity, we are becoming caught and caged by a certain notion and then we become stuck and we are visited then by unhelpful traits. And that hurts women, children and men. What I liked about what you were saying is giving people a pathway to be some of the change. And I think a pathway in, as you say, is sometimes it's about confronting the conversation. It's not always easy. Um, I know there's an online conversation. I just saw something today about a young woman who was um, in a bikini and her partner had shared it. And then she showed the comments. She was tiny wee thing. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, she was a fat whale. Look at her. The comments were shocking. And also that the boyfriend at the time didn't check it. It was just seemed to be fine. So those conversations, one, we can call them out because mm -hmm. they're there and they're confronting. And sometimes it feels uneasy. I think it's, it's so such an important thing for men when they hear that, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, if what you're hearing really doesn't resonate with you and you know that what someone is saying is wrong, then calling it out is a powerful thing to do, not a comfortable mm -hmm. thing to do, is a powerful thing to do. Do you have tips about how to do that? We absolutely do, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to share them through our digital barbershop. These are a series of um, resources that are available for download and they're free. They don't hide behind a paywall and they're accessible ways of educating and reinforcing those messages. So when we talk about calling out sexism, first and foremost, we need to be aware of what does sexism look like um, and we need to be um, aware of our own unconscious bias. So we know particularly that there are still some environments where they might think, well, that's just men's business or that's the way it's always been. That's some of the early warning signs that that's probably where we need to start. Um, I just want to go back to what you mentioned around those insidious forms of social media trolling. Um, technology facilitated abuse is a growing concern. In Australia, we've got the eSafety Commissioner that is working tirelessly to look at structures and interventions in those structures to create a digital ecosystem and community that is kind and compassionate. But I'm gonna be really vulnerable here. I'm not on social media. Uh, I don't have a Twitter. Um, I don't have a Facebook. Um, I don't have an Instagram or a Snap or whatever that, whatever that is. I have a LinkedIn. Um, if you wanna follow me for any of the tips, please do so. 
um, and I do write on it, so no one else, but I'm not on social media and I'm going to tell you why, because it's toxic. It is genuinely toxic. And if that's the 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 if that's the words that we're consuming every single day, um, it becomes um, something that impacts us. And also um, it doesn't reflect the reality that we're serving. So, but we can't just ignore it. So I'm taking a personal stance by saying I'm, I'm unplugging from digital platforms, but we also know that it's an important way of communicating and conveying community. And so we need, therefore, structural interventions, really stronger codes of conduct that are really enforced um, and not just by social media tech giants like the Metaverse or Facebook or Twitter. Um, we need to do that in our media institutions, the comments that are projected there, in our everyday interactions on microblogging sites or in, in, game of, in gaming sites like Twitch or Discord. We need to reinforce those codes of conduct and each of us, uh, we have the ability, uh, we have a voice and whether or not we type in that into a, into a keyboard and that appears on a screen, we all have the agency to choose what we're writing and if we can be kind and compassionate. Um, I'm not quite sure what gets in the way. I'm not quite sure what that looks like. But what I do know is that we've, when we're visited by really big emotions, a so frustration, anger, or we're processing on the run and we're not really thinking critically about the implications or natural consequences of what I say or what I share and the potential ramifications, um, that's when we start to unravel as a society. Yeah, I think that fear stops us sometimes speaking up. There's a part of the brain that thinks any kind of challenge that might then be criticised is dealt with the brain as threat. Or sometimes it can be threatening, you know, um, the mm. idea that you might then become a target of something. So I guess it's really layered. And so then it's it's sometimes with comments online, um, you've got to think about whether or not it's going to be the change you want to see. You know, it's, mm. it's sometimes making those comments, but you will... I've known people that then become a target of something else. You have to be prepared for that. So sometimes it might be working out where you're safe um, to have those conversations. Maybe for men, it's a little easier. I'm thinking about women sometimes taking up the cudgels online and then thinking, what have I done? Because it's the reason that you're not on social media, I'm imagining is that it just becomes, as you said, toxic. And although you might not agree with the stuff that's happening to you, you understand it's coming from a, a, a place that is that will be something about something different. If someone is incredibly toxic online, I'm thinking about the trolls that I know that have targeted women I know. Sometimes, mm -hmm. very rarely, there will be an acknowledgement that that interaction was about something else. So that um, I'm thinking about a specific instant, instance of someone I know where there was apology later to say everything I said at that time about you was about what was going on with me. As a man going through my stuff, I was angry at my girlfriend. I was taking it out on you. This was someone in the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, and this happens a lot, that idea of transference where you're angry with someone and online we can then start to take it out. And, it, and what you're saying is right, it can have a... a a flow on effect because words aren't words are powerful and words create a narrative and someone else reads it and, and it and it basically can flow on out. So there's one to protect yourself from it is not to be on there, but also that if you are on there thinking about how you protect yourself around making comments and inserting yourself in a conversation. If it feels okay to you, do it. If it feels like it's going to be another layer of diff difficulty for you so I guess these things are really tricky because of really. all of the consequences and I just want to be really clear I made that personal choice because I want to not be on there um, because right. it serves my interest um, we also um, if I want to be on there I should also, that's my choice as well as it is everybody's choices and we shouldn't be therefore restricted um, or feel like we can't be on there because we're afraid of what people are going to say. We all got to check ourselves. I mean, it starts here. We have the power and we, we can make these magical moments happen if we lead with kindness and compassion in every interaction. And there are some days that even all of us, we're visited by really big emotions um, there are some things that trigger us. There's antecedents like a piling work um, that might be causing us a little bit of stress or agitation. That that might mean that our window of tolerance is shorter, 
and it might might create us to choose a behaviour that we're not proud of. But when we make a deliberate choice to write something that is going to hurt or inflict harm, we are making that choice. And just as we are sending it out there, we have the responsibility of taking it back. And I know we've talked about this previously, but the importance of seven seconds. So taking that deep moment to pause, reflect and think. And it could just be thinking that deep breath in and then rewrite, rereading what you've got to say. And what we see when we take that pause particularly, we we kick into that kind of logical mindset. Um, and I talk a lot about this with young people, about whether or not we're in lizard brain or wizard brain. Because when we're in that lizard brain, anything's on. It's all on. But when we get into that wizard brain, we start to have that cognitive, logical thinking and rationality set in. And it can take as minimum as seven seconds. So if the only thing we're doing is to create a moment where we take pause before we write something, that would be wonderful um, because maybe that's then when we can reduce some of that toxicity. I love that. And again, it's action-based, which you are about the actions. What can we do? As a parent of a young men, of young men, um, what do you suggest? I know that that online, and we'll move away from online, but there's some online rhetoric that's bothersome and worrying when it comes to some of those sexism and um, sexist kind of tropes and some, uh, um, some, some groups of young boys, maybe they're about 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, getting into those kind of chatty type conversations where we know that some of the unhealthy rhetoric is, is there. Do you have some tips for parents in that situation? Well, first of all, parents got to parents got to um, got to lean into those levels of discomfort and not deny or discount or dilute what's going on. Um, often we we I mean uh, uh, as parents we often go in and we want to protect our children and say oh gosh that can't be the way not my not my um, son not my daughter. Um, and we first got to just lean in with those open eyes. So if we know something is going on, well, first of all, it tells me that you're really connected, that there's mm-hmm. some trust and a bond there. It means that you you switched on and that use that moment to be really curious. Um, and the worst thing we can do is start any sentence. If we start a sentence with don't or no, um, you're shutting down a conversation. So instead reframe it and flip it on its head. I, I'm wondering um, what I see there or um I, um, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about why you think that way. So leaning in with that genuine sense of curiosity, um, we need to then role model. So we can say as much education as we want to young people. And in fact, um, I believe the first the first real generational shift that we're going to see is that we can definitely have um, children growing up in violence-free homes and living violence-free lives. I genuinely feel in that generation that's where we start. So the problem is just not young people or or young boys. It's what's reinforced in those environmental settings. So parents in itself have a really important um, role modelling effect or guiding and mentoring. So we need to also check on our own behaviours and the way that we're responding. When we look at structural, though, structural intervention, we also need to set adults, children, everyone up for success. And so if it, we need to make the right thing to do the easiest thing to do. So I think about health promotion. So I think about, um, um, I think about some of the most effective campaigns around change. And one that probably draws to my mind is around um, tobacco smoking. So, I mean, my dad's generation, so not that long ago, that everyone was smoking. It was pretty, pretty out, much out there. Now it was a coordinated, multiple um, approach to it. But things like taking away the ashtray out of like a, a pub, um, restricting where you can smoke, so making it from in, not smoking indoors and taking it outdoors, and then putting plain packaging on cigarettes, smoking, so we can't lure and be seducted by these um, advertising um, techniques and that psychology. So this, it was a multimodal impact, but it was a it was a systemic impact um, and changes that occurred, and that was successful. It drove down the numbers of smoking rates um, and therefore increased some of the health behaviours. Now, have we got it right? I I haven't been in the anti um, anti tobacco space, so I'm not quite sure. But I know genuinely from my own observations, it's not a problem as it was um, maybe 20 years ago when I was just leaving high school. 
So we can tackle these things really proactively, but we need structural intervention alongside individual behavioural change. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because when you're talking about entrenched behaviour, that's no good, just insight's not going to lead to that behaviour change. We know that with smoking, telling people that it caused cancer was not enough. That's not what it is. You have to change some of the, the societal uh, triggers because a lot of that behaviour is, is triggered. And I think I've spoken to you before about my background in criminal justice, and I would have said I've never seen an offender that when I looked at their background, I wasn't surprised because... What happens is we are a bit, we are a product of the things that we see, the, the 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 experiences that we have, and so this is not something that's just a big shock where we go, all right. So how do we in New Zealand and in Australia, where we have um, unacceptable levels of family violence, how do we then say it's not enough to just go, well, we've looked at it and we don't love it. Um, here's some information for you to change your behavior. There's a lot about what you're saying about setting up, how do we create the environment where one is about tolerance, but it's also recognition. And I think what I liked about you saying, all right, so some of that languaging around how we speak about women, but sometimes it's not even that because we know with family violence, it can be quite hidden. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's not just about this idea of what where family violence sits is often, oh, well, we know that it's about poor and poverty and blah. You know what? It's through everywhere. It's, it's, in, it's in boardrooms where, where people who are really well resourced that you don't know that that happens. It is actually very, very hidden. So there has to be something that gives us as a society a way of sending the message. And we have to send it through the courts and sometimes the way that judges speak about it because there is something around the idea that not so long ago, women were chattels, so were children. We've been able to shift some of the ideas around snacking children, which I think was in the right direction. And if we can just shift the idea of how we see human beings, that will be really important. So tell me about the role of workplaces, because that sounds strange to many to say, well, it's not, isn't it? It's this family. Work is not family. So how is family violence a workplace issue? Yeah. And... Um, thank you so much for um, sharing. I love your insights and particularly your background because our backgrounds are so multifaceted, so it kind of weaves into this. And although you're not doing that work per se anymore, it, the lessons that we've learned there still apply, and I love that kind of agility. Um, workplaces particularly um, play a critical role um, in reinforcing respect, um, reinforcing and reframing what it means to provide safety and well-being. And we know that domestic violence erodes a women's sense of safety um, and well-being, and therefore workplaces play a critical role in ensuring that women or victims or people currently going through some form of domestic violence are as best supported so they're not impacted. Um, I can't, I don't have the up-to-date statistics, but I, I've recalled previously that um, for women that are experiencing some form of domestic violence, it was over 60% of them were working. So in the, yeah. in the workplace right. environment. So which means that it does necessarily intersect. And I probably spend, like most of us, are our, our most formidable hours um, in a workplace. So it is it's a huge part of our life. And so therefore, workplaces must demonstrate a sustained commitment to gender equality, women's safety, particularly not only through its strategic approach, but through its practices that utilises not only people insights to inform opportunities of growth and kindness, but also attends to their positive duty under legislation. And in here in Australia, we have some really strict and robust fair work, um, fair work um, legislation to ensure that that workplace creates the employment conditions that are necessary for achieving women's safety. And it starts at the top. So first and foremost, we need to have leaders that are switched on, aware, um, adequately trained and, and role modelling because then everything's built in that ecosystem be beneath it. So strategic planning, um, executive level, management level training, short, medium, long-term targets to set, and alignment with sustainability goals around gender equality and ensuring that there's really good shareholder and stakeholder sentiment and buy-in, um, internal, external communication um, strategies, budgetary allocations, 
But fundamentally, leadership and organisations, that's just my little alarm going off to apologise, um, fundamentally workplace leadership sets the tone yeah. of culture. Yeah. Okay. And so within workplaces, there might be some things to, to do around even having um, posters on the wall or some conversations that perhaps it's highlighted, like White Ribbon Day is actually a good opportunity for workplaces to show support and bring in speakers or start to have start the conversation because it's an easy way in to start the conversation because a lot of these behaviors um, are hidden. It's not always obvious. And so being able to start the conversation does give people who are maybe the victims or perpetrators some way of reaching out for help because it's both way. Because sometimes it's like, who do I talk to? Yeah. Um, who do I reach out to? So if you're someone in a situation where you actually need help because of your violent tendencies, or it's often tied with drugs and alcohol, that you have somewhere in your workplace that you know that your workplace will support you to get help. And the other way is for people who are on the other end of the spectrum, who are in those um, dire situations where they need help. And sometimes work might be the safe place. Um, at home, it's not so easy to reach out. And so providing the numbers, making sure that it's part of the, the conversation, no matter which workplace we're talking about, you know, there's some stereotypes about what workplaces we're talking. And I've worked in law firms and I've worked, I've worked in very many spaces and domestic and or family violence has, has affected all of them. And that kind of brings me to what do we do as individuals if we're concerned about somebody? You know, that there, there's the thing about how we change the dialogue and we start to make sure that we are not normalizing behaviors that we want to see change. But what do we do if we're worried, if we think that there might be something going on? Don't tune out, tune in. That's fundamentally most important. Get educated, be aware. So White Ribbon Australia provides some of the tools and resources for organisations. Um, it's called the Digital Barbershop, and it really paints the picture of what individuals can do and to learn about the issue. Second of all, encourage a hygiene check or a policy check. I mean, each of us, when we're entering into a different workplace, can definitely ask about equal pay policy, domestic violence prevention policy, supports that are in place for open disclosures, whistleblower policy, um, occupational health and safety record. We have a lot of agency before we even enter a workplace, and it's an employee's market at the moment. So that could be one of the benefits. And in fact, it should be one of the benefits that we're leading with as we choose an employer to work for. We also can start by having deep and connected conversations. So virtual, and virtual hybrid is not going anywhere. Um, I, I find that um, one of the missing elements that we've got in workplaces at the moment is that in situ moment of catching up or being able to read the whole entire person. And I know that there's been modifications made to move beyond the screen, but fundamentally when we're in the office, we can see different levels of behavioural change, withdrawal, um, anxiety, um, that comes through or um, short temperament. Um, we could, if we see a, div, um, a change in behaviour, well, that's a red flag for us that something's not right. Um, how do we do that online? It's a little bit more difficult. It's not not an impossible task, but it just becomes a little bit more um, important for us to do more mindful check-ins, creating an operating rhythm where we're having those moments to ask and check in what's going on, what is really going on, um, and when we start to then look at action and intervention, if we suspect anybody is in immediate danger or at risk of harm or abuse, the authorities could be called. It should be called. We have to do that kind of risk assessment. And it's not us coming in and being the hero. It's not us saving the day. Um, and it's also not being the fun police. I've heard this time and time again. I can't intervene because I'm the fun police. With are respecting forces and respect comes through compassionate interactions and engagements. Yes, and um, if you're in ongoing dialogue with somebody, you've had the check-in, you know, are you okay? And sometimes it might be, I like the, what you said, something like lean in or stay in or yeah. what did you say? Lean in? Um, lean, in lean into the discomfort. Lean into the discomfort, beautiful. I mean, sometimes it's hard to have that conversation and so having those conversation starters that we know helpful when we're talking about all sorts of issues that might feel uncomfortable. So starting, are you okay? Or how's it going? And, and we know in situations like that, there's a lot of shame. And so people don't necessarily disclose 
but you might see some behaviors. Now, what are the red flags? Red flags in a relationship that you are viewing are things like controlling behavior. So you yeah. might not see, you might not see violence, but you might see control. You might see, you can see, oh, I'm sorry, in, in a relationship, I can't go out tonight because I, you know, my husband or won't let me or my partner or there are some signs there over and over again that might make you go, I would like to have that conversation. Now, women at home, I mean, again, because I'm in a criminal justice system and I still do some work there, I'm aware that, you know, leaving is not always the, the safest thing to do. So we have to pause our judgment as well, because I think that if we are coming in to have conversations, we often feel like, well, I've, I've, I've reached out, they don't want my help, and that's the end of it understanding that this is really tricky and difficult and so it's not your job to solve it it's your job to listen and possibly get and if you think that you're in immediate danger it's definitely call emergency services but in terms of that relationship people don't usually disclose straight away they may not ask for help from you straight away but one of the things you can ask is if they've got essentially a safety plan um, for many people who go in and, and living in environments where they're unsafe what you can help them with is you're the phone number. You're the, you're the phone number. You say, look, if you need me, give me a call. Um, there are things that if you're in a situation where you are at risk, knowing that where you can go is important. It might, you're not, might not be ready yet, but having that plan can be really helpful. And you might be the person who's reached out and says, I'm the number. I'll come and pick you up. Absolutely. Um, and we also need to, I love what you say there in terms of safety planning as well, because it's critical. Um, and that's at the very tertiary end. Um, mm -hmm. Those early mumberings of coercion and control, um, we, we just we got to know our people that are around us. We just got to know our people. Um, and we're a social being, so it, it shouldn't come, it's not unnatural for us to know um, ourselves and to go beyond our kind of work persona. I, re I really like that. I think, I think the more that we have these conversations, I think this, that there is benefit in us understanding that it can affect anyone yeah. understand that it's not a it's not a shameful thing um if you have been and it feels like it it feels like it for many women um in my early days practicing i found it really quite disturbing when we'd have protection orders and people would go back to the partner that had been abusive and that's a passion and we've got to suspend judgment about that i think as a society we've got to shift the narrative around behaviors that are um, coercive, coercive about the way that we think about women, but we've also got to help um, in terms of drug and alcohol addiction, intervening early with family violence because family violence leads breeds family violence. So as a society, what we have is an obligation to what you said, which was intervene early, change the conversation, make this something that we change in terms of normalizing it. And then I think we will see that shift. So we, you've given us some sort of tips around how organizations um, need to think about this and they can how did it's digital it's a digital um did the digital barber shop so um i should probably i'll find the link and um we'll send it around now alan has got eight minutes to go because he's just about to leave uh, and he's been told there's been an accident on the m2 so mm. if you've got a question for us pop it into the chat now when we'll get through it in the next eight minutes you've been very generous with your time alan given your day um, so while people think about the questions that they might want to ask and ask you, you're going to, you said you'd provide a link to the digital tools? Yes, I will find, I'll get a link to the digital tools. Excellent. And what we will do and resources that come to you will also um, contain, there'll be some information about what to do if you're worried. So there's some things like helplines in New Zealand and Australia that we will be providing. Um, and, and in terms of your, are you doing some more work around white ribbon today that's where you're off yeah so i'm going got a couple of different events and activities what i love the most about these things is that we we don't describe or define what community is to us to individuals and i love when i get to kind of tap in and see how individuals are interacting and then you overlay that with our world i mean my world is domestic violence men's domestic violence prevention and men's violence prevention particularly and i I love when I go into a, an activity or event or to a workplace that's immune to this kind of stuff or entering into it for the first time. And you have to have a deep level of respect that there is a culture that you're entering into. Um, and I'm very mindful of that as well. And uh, and when we look at where domestic violence prevention goes well, 
It's when we respect boundaries, where we respect the strengths that are already there in existence, and when we value the assets that we have something to play with. And so there is a lot of work around Australia, a lot of great work. And in fact, the good news is, is that most men in Australia and New Zealand are not violent. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And, and that we have a responsibility, one, we have to celebrate the behaviour that we want to see. And um, there's been an enormous shift even in my lifetime, you know, um, in terms of being a woman generally, there's work to be done around the world. This is a global issue. Um, and I think Australia, I'm really proud of the work that you're doing in Australia. And I've seen, you know, really brave, courageous conversations that are difficult and hard and that people like you are enabling them is an absolute joy and, and a privilege for me to hear some of the initiatives. And I think the idea of the way that you walk in the world with compassion, you say, I don't come in there and I listen first. I figure out what do they need from me? And I don't know their culture. So I'm coming in and I'm figuring out what this organization needs, what people need from me, because we know that talking at people doesn't work. Yeah. Um, we need to, you're a really good listener. So if we're going to, given that you've got to run, what are you, what are a couple of bullet points that we should take away from today? We can, we can also donate, can't we, to White Ribbon? Absolutely. So you can donate to our programs, um, programs like what is happening this week. We've got 400 young men um, in year 11 and 12 going through one of our Respectful Relationships program where they ask us, um, questions that they're Googling or searching online um, because young people are still very curious and they need guidance and good mentorship and that's one of the programs we provide. Fundamentally, what we're asking Australians and New Zealanders, New Zealanders, Kiwis, I should say, Aussies and Kiwis to do and the rest of the world is if you're a man, um, understand that you have a power and privilege um, and that's a gendered power and privilege. And it's not something you should be embarrassed of or ashamed of. You need to be just aware of it and understand that for some, half the world's population, they don't have that. And that puts you in an extraordinary position, um, which could mean behaviours of abuse or neglect or harassment, or it could mean choosing behaviours of allyship, um, companionship, compassion and kindness. And if you are anyone that's really, really, really keen to get going and join the movement, you can do so by creating change in your local community. The problem of family violence or men's violence towards women and their children, unfortunately, is not unique to a single community or setting, but the solutions are. And when we start when we, um, when we start with communities and respect what they've got and their cultures and traditions, then we're starting on the on a foot of togetherness and unity um, and strength and empowerment. Oh, that's beautifully said. I am going to let you run. What you're talking about is human dignity. And we give back dignity mm. to people, then behaviour often changes. And so I, I love everything that you um, said. I love the work that you're doing. I'm going to give you your time back because I know that you have to run. Um, I'm going to thank everyone for joining Thanks us. Thanks so We've much. Got Bye, Ellen. Um, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again. We hope you've got something out of this and we'll send you the recording and some resources around it. Bye. Bye. Oh, well, I've still got people online. I thought we'd gone. All right. So for those of you still online, thank you for joining us. We will um, see you again. Thank you so much. Kakite.